Oved. Uh, Ellie Friedman from the Strategic Dialogue Center. I have uh, two questions. The first is for both Danny Seaman and Bradley Burston. I'm wondering, within the context of legitimate criticism versus delegitimization, how would you place uh, Peter Beinhardt's recent uh, approach about boycotting the settlements and through a, Zion a pro Zionist boycott of only the settlements while strengthening uh, ec economic ties with Israel? And my second question is for Nitsana. You mentioned towards the beginning of your lecture that the fly-in was illegal. I, it baffles me why that would be illegal. I'm wondering if you can clarify. It seems that it's, they, they were not causing a disturbance. The disturbance was the reaction. Please clarify. Um. Peter Beinart is welcomed to his opinion. He is, he's welcome to his opinion. I don't care what he thinks. Um, now we have, to, we have to remember, when it all comes down to it, we're in a few weeks, two weeks, we're celebrating our 64th anniversary. And with every, all the accusations and all the attacks against Israel, look at what we've achieved. And it's not that we should take it for granted. But on the other hand, it should give us that confidence and that ability um, to sometimes not get worked up by people who are looking for publicity like uh, Peter, whatever his name is. Um, by now, by now. I could call him a few other things. Um, I had mentioned before there's nothing new about this. And, and the point I wanted to make but we didn't have enough time was that I, when I was looking back at things, it's not only the, the Arab League that started the boycott back in 1945, or maybe 1936, as I was corrected there. But um, the, the, the pressure on Israel, for example, in the 1950s, there was something I've discovered called the Alpha Operation, where the Britons and the Americans wanted to apply pressure. This is 1955. No occupation. Well, there was occupation, at least according to the okay. attitudes at the time, of Palestinian lands. This was before settlements, but there were settlements. The same places that some people in Israel believe are free of that accusation. Somebody who's, anybody who thinks today that they can, can separate between Jewish communities in Judea and Samaria and Jewish communities throughout the land of Israel don't know what they're talking about. Because back in 1955, when the, Ameri when the Eisenhower put pressure on Ben-Gurion, and Ben-Gurion was stubborn, and this was, I'm reading through the history of this whole thing, and they, there was a whole campaign there to get Israel to make concessions, Israel, again, to make concessions to the Egyptians, and they found out that uh, they couldn't decide, uh, the question of blame remains is insufficient willingness to make painful concessions. What, what concessions could we have made then? But the, uh, the interesting thing is that you can see at the time there was also uh, an effort, to the, the, there was a book there, it's called The Military Rule, Political Manipulation and Jewish Settlement, Israeli Mechanisms for Controlling Nazareth in the 1950s. From Arab lands to Israeli lands, the legal disposition of Palestinians displaced by Israel in 1948. If anybody thinks that once we leave Judea and Samaria, that we shall not do, but if anybody thinks that that will bring on this desired peace, these things will start popping up at the time. So with all due respect to Peter Beinart, I know one thing. For 2,000 years, the thing that kept us was our belief in our right to the land of Israel and will continue preserving us in the future. And those who want to change things and be nice to the rest of the world, um, Luckily today, we have the state of Israel, we have the people of Israel, and the people of Israel... And, and I just wanted to say something about people in Berkeley who come to Israel. I welcome every Jew in Berkeley to come to Israel, to have the debates here. Um, I assume we disagree on some things, but I'd much rather have us disagreeing on it here in Israel and sharing in the future of the state of Israel and the fate of the state of Israel instead of having people like Peter, what's his name, in the United States trying to dictate to us what is in our best interest. Um, I want to try to find a way to make an appeal for civility without making it seem as though I'm attacking Danny. I think that it's an important question, not specifically because of Peter Beinhardt, but because of something which is broader, which is the idea that at some point you have to decide on a line between 
us and them, the people that support Israel, support the idea of having a Jewish state in something close to the form that it takes now, and people who simply do not. The dividing line, I mean, that's why the BDS movement is so important. Little by little, the, the, um, the kind of uh, wrappings are coming off the boycott movement. And it's becoming clearer and clearer that the people that support the overall boycott of Israel, this is BDS, and not, the, not necessarily boycotting settlements, but the specific boycott of Israel as a whole, the BDS movement, they really don't want to see a Jewish state here. There will be one state here, it'll be called Palestine, and that's it. And this is, it's taken years and years and years to get them to admit what it is that they actually want. And, and ironically, the person who, who kind of took the wrapping off was, was Norman Finkelstein, who was kind of their guru for many years, but who, who finally, just a little while ago, um, gave a lecture or an interview in which he said, basically, they're lying. They don't want there to be an Israel. It's all a lie. They want Israel to be destroyed. I think it's very important in this, in the climate that we're in right now, in the kind of talkback world that we're in right now, try to preserve communication between people who have different views about what that Jewish state should look like, what the boundaries should be, how Israel should progress with a peace process, or if Israel should progress with a peace process. We have to make sure, and, and, and I understand, I think I understand exactly what you're saying and why you're saying it, but I think we have a special responsibility to kind of um, fly against, there's a terrible, terrible climate, which is, unfortunately, I, I'm certainly a part of it. It has to do directly with the internet. It has to do with the idea of being able to say anything you want, whenever you want, and, and what, it, what it fosters is hatred within the community. And I think it's really important for us to keep lines of communication open between various people who have points, various points of view, all of whom who support the idea of having a Jewish state. They're, they are, you may disagree with them and think that they are dead wrong if they happen to be on the other side of your position, but they are legitimate because they all want to see a strong, healthy Israel here. Uh, the question was why the uh, flat flatillas act are a violation of the Israeli law. And um, by, with, with their declaration of coming here to Israel um, with hundreds of people through the Ben Gurion airport, they announced that they are going to come and protest against Israeli uh, policy. Um, against the Palestinians, against the settlements, whatsoever. They call their flightilla a protest flightilla. So although they, declared, they, they, they claim that their pure intentions are to go to Bethlehem, in the end, what they really wanted to do is to disturb the order in the Ben Gurion airport. And it's not the first time they're doing it. They're doing it in the, through the sea. With a flotilla, they were doing it in the borders between Syria and Jordan when the masses of people are invading Israel. And this is their way to uh, express their protest. This is a violation of Israeli law. And I don't have to explain why, because in order to demonstrate in any place you need a permit from the Israeli police, uh, more than three people need a permit. I don't think any of them got a permit from the Israeli police in advance. Um, the emergency regulations of the State of Israel say clearly that if you are not allowed to come to Ben Gurion Airport, you cannot invade the airport. If there is an order from the police commander not to enter the airport, you are not allowed to do so. If you are doing it, you are a, a, you will be indicted and will spend three months in jail. And um, finally, some of the people say that in order to trick the police, 
they will enter the uh, Israeli borders with fake names because most of the activists, or most of the ex extremists were known to the Israeli police and they already warned the um, um, companies, um, they call it Air Force, Air, um, Airlines, not to allow these uh, people to come. So many of them said, okay, we will change our name and go to Israel uh, with a fake name, and this is another violation of the Israeli law. Thank you. Please. I'm Gary Dalen, came to this conference from Los Angeles. I, as, I want to address uh, Mr. Burson uh, regarding the J Street. Uh, just as uh, Ms. Darshan Lair uh, pointed out that the insurance companies felt liable to, in support of supporters of Hamas. They were also liable supporting terrorism because they supported the supporters. So it is with J Street. With J Street, its stars are people like Finkelstein and Chomsky, whose books appear on Salah Haddin Street, uh, together with every hater of Zionism. But more than that, it's an amalgam of people in different organizations, such as the Jews for Peace in the Middle East, which I call Jews for Jihad, who always show up in a pro-demonstration, pro-Israel demonstration on the Arab side of the street. Their, their policies are to include every hater of Israel, and it's not love of Israel, it's hatred of Israel. And being in the field and knowing the people in J Street, I know why the Federation in Los Angeles rejects it, and every major organization rejects it because this amalgamation, that is, they do not reject organizations which indeed hate Israel. And that's why I beg to differ, and I want to ask you your opinion of how you can resolve the two, the, this issue uh, of if they do have uh, among them welcomed the people who indeed hate Israel, uh, who call themselves Jews, then, and do not reject them, then are they not liable Any by question, association. Do you have a question? Are they not liable, is not J Street liable by association Thanks. with these people? Okay, thanks. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, first of all, a number of the things that you said at the beginning are simply not true. And I don't know that we have time for it all, but they are simply not true. And you know, you're entitled to your opinion, but the facts are wrong. No. Okay. For example, for example, the Jewish Voice for Peace you mentioned. You 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 you, you mentioned the organization. You you misspoke when you mentioned the name of the organization. It's called the Jewish Voice for Peace. This is not a J Street constituent. Okay. All right. Fine. Since when, I understand, the, you say that the Federation rejects J Street. And what does that mean? So? Okay. So? I don't, I don't, I don't understand what the, I don't understand. If, if you want to, all right, let, let's, um, let's put this another way. Okay, shall we just, and I, one sentence, one sentence left over. I think people are entitled to have a vision of a state of Israel that differs from other people who want to have a vision of a state of Israel. They are not interested in the destruction of Israel, and that's what matters. They really want to see a better Israel. They may be wrong, you may be right, but they're motive and, the, and, and their, their true intent is to make this a better place. Find something. Uh, Moti, בבקשה. You know, you know the teacher that talks to the class and yells about the, the, the kids that didn't come Bradley, to class? Bradley, אתה לא חייב לענות. Michael Bliss, uh, from Netanya and before that from London. Um, I would have liked to have asked uh, uh, the morning speaker, uh, Nachman Shai, 
who uh, said that the way the government dealt with the flytilla uh, showed their abject uh, uh, refusal to come up, come into the, the modern world. That the, what they did uh, at, uh, with the flytilla uh, was counterproductive because it did what, they, what the people wanted. I would have thought that the way the government dealt with the flytilla uh, was very successful. It, it became a damp squib, uh, 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 and me. I wondered Ex if Daniel Seaman would, Sorry, would like to comment. Nachman Shai is not here. Do you have a question? Yes, I'd like Daniel Seaman to comment on whether the way the government dealt with the, the flytilla was successful in preventing future flytillas. It said that after the fall of the second temple, prophecy was given to fools, so I'm not going to try to prophesize about the future. Uh, I don't want to remark on what uh, Nachman Shai said, because first off, he's a politician, I'm a civil servant, so I can't remark on that. I, and he's not here, I don't know what he said. I'm, I would assume he had criticism, some of which may be true. Um, I can say this, it was well prepared, well addressed, but as usual, we have diarrhea of the mouth in this country. <laughs> and sometimes, when I, and I was serious when I said before, the 64th anniversary of Israel, we can take pride and, and take confidence in all that we've achieved, and we don't have to get hysteric about everything. But you also have the necessity here for people to show achievement. So that when you have the next Vadat Chakira, the next uh, investigative uh, committee, they can all show what they've done right. We've done a lot right this time. The only thing is that we have this tendency to, to, to keep yapping about it. We don't, uh, first off, uh, it's a country that doesn't know modesty. Uh, it's a country that people don't know how to be modest at times. Um, I don't think, um, you know, we shouldn't have given them the publicity by showing how well prepared we were, should, we were. They should have just done it. But the problem is this country, if we had done and gone by quietly, nobody would have done, known how successful we were to stop it. But I'm a civil servant. We, we, we assumed that this would have happened. We knew this would have happened. We didn't know that some of these pictures that came out would have happened, but we were prepared for that also. Um, as somebody who's dealt with this for 30 years, I can say, at least from being at the inside, we are much better at it today than we were before. But it's a democracy. There are politicians involved. There are people who are looking for advancement. That's not, you know, that's the, the people involved in public diplomacy can't do anything about that. And that's Thank all you. I'll say. Shalom, uh, Ruven. My name is Danny Grossman. Unlike London or Los Angeles, I come all the way from Kuchav Yair. Although, of course, by way of Tel Nof, where we know each other. And I, first of all, I want to compliment you, uh, Ruven, on this excellent day and all, the, all of your colleagues here who put together a wonderful program. But with that compliment comes a, ch comes a question and a challenge for you and your colleagues. You don't have to answer right now. And anyone on the, on the panel can answer this. This is not a matter of opinion. I hate to sound like, look like Joe McCarthy holding up a little list. But if you look, do a content analysis for 26 speakers and panelists today, of which two are women. Uh, I think, no, by the way, and both women on the panel were, uh, were outstanding, and, but they were, not on, they were not speaking as women or on any gender issues. They were both extremely capable professionals who've done amazing work. Now, that being said, although public diplomacy, countering assaults on Israel's legitimacy is not a gender issue and it is not a women's rights issue or anything. The fact that, uh, I think it was uh, Mati Nagar talked about perceptions, the fact that there is a perception, and by the way, you can go to any, these, there are several conferences of this anywhere, anywhere in Israel, I've attended dozens of them, and it's usually the same, the usual suspects, the same, more or less that. My question is to the organizers, however, what can be done, first of all, is there a, I, I believe firmly that just, listen, I believe firmly, just like <laughs> the, that we need, <laughs> you'll, you'll understand it, a little bit of this, just as a different perspective in trying to help in, is, in assault Israel legitimacy, we need to break out of the box as one of the next uh, sessions going to have, we also need to run in the kohot. We need more women in our ranks. What is this conference going to look like next year? And I know, like Danny says, we can't predict the future. Yogi Berra says it's hard to predict the future, especially, okay? 
what are we going to be doing to get okay. more women in the ranks of the people who are dealing with this? <laughs> Thank you. I agree. Um, my name is Sarah. I'm actually born and raised in San Francisco Bay Area. I lived in Berkeley for eight years before I came to Israel. When I came to Israel, I joined the ISM because I was so brainwashed by faux leftist, faux pro-Israeli groups. What is ISM? It's the International Solidarity Movement. That's the Rachel Corey and the one that died in Gaza from Hamas. I spent three years uh, participating in pro-Hamas, uh, you know, peace groups before I got my head on straight because I was so brainwashed by being raised in a place where being pro-Israel means that to love Israel, all you do is abuse it and criticize it. So I was brought up by a strong woman who told me if all a man does is beat you, he doesn't love you. And I would like you to address how you reconcile so many Jews end up like me um, coming here, joining the ISM because of groups like J Street and how you reconcile that um, they're not a fifth column. Anybody? Okay, well, first of all, um, you know, I, I certainly, uh, I, I have a lot of respect for your journey from from there to here, but <laughs> Jews don't come here. Jews don't come here for any reason. They don't come here. The vast majority of Jews would be much better served by coming here, seeing what goes on, and learning about it firsthand. They don't come at all. The reason, for the, the, the reason why brainwashing works to begin with is they never see this place. Birthright, for all of its other, whatever you think of it, physically transports Jews here. And chances are, birthright has done more to change perceptions for American Jews about Israel, certainly for young American Jews, than anything else and any other organization has done. And why? Because this place cannot be seen from there. What you see there is this bizarre funhouse mirror of American Judaism. You don't see Israel. You see this bizarre amalgam of all kinds of stuff. The answer is, somehow, you get Jews over here and they see for themselves. And in your case, it worked. And in many other cases, it works. <clears throat> And that may work better than anything else. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. My, my name is Nathan Nestel. Uh, I want to follow up what Sarah said. I also studied at Berkeley. As uh, Berkeley, I remember you when you were in the Radical Jewish Union in Berkeley. And Sarah's Sarah point is a very important one. Many Jews, after being exposed to, and I make the distinction between criticism and the demonization. And you don't make this distinction. And the, I'm the founder, by the way, of the Jewish Student Union, the organization that you refer to, which rejected the J Street. Your name is Natan. Yes, Natan. I remember you folk dancing. <laughs> <laughs> the point is, and I, I don't Natan, think you Natan, not points, a question. Yeah, do you I, have a question? Yeah, but it's a No, 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 do you have a question? I have a because question. You see how many? Any question, please? Many, yeah, my question is about the distinction between demonization and criticism, but I want to follow it. I want to give some background. Many Jews in Berkeley and all over the US now are being alienated from Israel by events which demonize Israel. The, the divestment bill that you referred to happened in spring 2010. The whole year before it, there were event after events which laid the ground for the divestment bill. And those events demonized Israel. I mean, they described the IDF as an army which commits war crimes and Israel as a country which is committing ethnic cleansing. Now, it was done by the, the legitimization network, which is a Jewish Voice for Peace, Students for Justice in Palestine, Muslim Student Association. 
and include the group. בגללך אחרים לא יוכלו לשאול, אתה רוצה לשאול שאלה בבקשה. It included the group which is called Kesh Enoshi, which is a Hillel group. And this, this really caused the main damage, because when Jews are involved with events which demonize Israel, this is really what has an effect on the students. Now, all, all the students which belong to the Kesh Enoshi later found that J Street. Hey, Nathan, or you have a question, or die, really, no, I'm asking you. My question is, if you, see, if you make a distinction between criticism, which is legitima, legitimate, and demonizing events, which are really falsely accuse the IDF and Israel of things which, like war crimes and ethnic cleansing. I mean, do you see a distinction? You just, or not? Yes, absolutely. There is an absolute difference between demonizing Israel and discussing what goes on there with, with an eye toward, toward seeing how things could be different. Demonizing Israel, and there's no question that those groups do exist and that, that many groups exist only to make Israel look terrible. And believe me, for every one of those, I got a thousand more. I have an obsession with reading these websites. It's a particular failing of mine, a bad habit. It's like, it's like you know, picking at a scab. You know, it's very bad. But, but that's exactly my point. The point is, what is the intention of these people? If they don't want to see a state of Israel around, that's real demonization. If they want to work with what exists and make it a better country, that's legitimate criticism. Yeah, Thank you. You judge it by the reaction. Un unfortunately, the last question, please. Okay. Um, one is a statement and one is a question. The statement is one, the statement is one sentence, the question is one sentence. The statement is that if any of you who are here know lawyers anywhere in the world or in Israel, see that they know about Shorat Hadin and begin to organize lawyer education about using law in international and national forums. Secondly, I have a question for Advocate Kamal. Um, we just had an amazing lady from Dalyat HaKamel named Rania come and speak on the whole west coast of the United States with an Israeli Jewish former soldier. And it was an extraordinary experience for all of us. Um, my question to you is, in, in your position in, uh, uh, in the Arab college that's in your biography, can you tell us how these issues that we're talking about here are addressed among Israel's Arab citizens, Jews, Bedouin, and otherwise. Thank you. And thank you for an extraordinary paper. You know, when I heard what's going now, and especially the questions and the answers, I said to myself, when I, I lived in country, I graduated from Hebrew secondary school, university, and also Israeli army, and uh, as the anti-Semitism, most of my best and kind friends are Jews. And when I uh, heard that all of you uh, uh, criticize each other, and you, uh, the fundamentalism that I heard politically, ideally, and uh, what I, I heard now, Exactly, I criticized this fundamentalism and extremely attitudes also among the Arabs because uh, uh, we heard about who support Hamas or support the PLO and so on. I want to say that one a day, Israel will recognize Hamas regime in Gaza exactly as the uh, Israeli did with the PLO before uh, 1994. Uh, 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 Therefore, I want to say that today, one of the basic policy among the Arabs, especially in Israel, is to give education to their children, and they <coughs> want them to be involved in Israeli economic and also education and also politics, and what I want to say that one of the last uh, voters of the Israeli politicians, uh, uh, Mufaz, he was voted because the Arabs support him to be the chief of the Kadiba uh, politically uh, uh, party in Israel. Therefore, I think 
the question how we want to live in peace. And I think you can criticize me, you can criticize my ideas, but one thing you have to think, how we can live together. You can speak about nationalism, about community, about Jewish people all the day. But the question, how you want to live with the others? This is the question. And this is the main question. This is the main question. I hope that the Jewish people, not only the American who can, uh, 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 who can uh, 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 support this nominated president or not, you have to think <coughs> how you can live among the different uh, peoples. This is the question to the Jewish people. This is the question. It's not only to be exceptional. You have to live with the others. I am different of you, but this is my country, this is my state, and I will continue living here, even you want or not. No. The question, how you want to live with no, me. My question this is, is are, are your students having this conversation with you? Let me, let me you? answer Thank one you. minute. Last sentence, Last Daniel. sentence. The Minister of Public Diplomacy sent a group for the second year of over 100 Israelis abroad. We contacted through the Arab media Israeli Arab citizens. Over 200 Israeli Arab citizens, Druze, Bedouin, Muslims, Christians, contacted at our office. Uh, well, I'm, we're not involved in Poland. I'm just talking about the group that we sent out called the Faces of Israel. The response that we got from the Israeli Arab community was astounding. And they came, they knew they were going to represent Israel. We told them to tell their personal story, not get involved in the politics. But you see their involvement and their willingness to be part of the society. And I think that's the best way to end this uh, session Thank on you. a positive note. Uh,